And thank you, Sister Velma James. Thank you so much for that powerful prayer. And um, uh, may we govern ourselves accordingly um, for that uh, uh, that prayer. Um, last week, we talked about the omniscience of God and uh, the psalmist's response to that. Uh, particularly, we're, we're talking about uh, David and his response to the omniscience of God, an all-knowing God was so overwhelming to him uh, that he had the instinct to hide. I think it's interesting that uh, Velma mentioned that in her prayer, that uh, there can be uh, the uh, instinct to hide when we are in front of an all-knowing God. And so I want to pick up right where we left off last week with a homework question, uh, this week's homework. And I told you to read Psalm 139 five times because I wanted you to just get it in your system and get a sense of familiarity with the words and the text of Psalm 139. And I gave you this reflection question, in what ways are God's omnipresence a blessing, but maybe also problematic? Uh, let's start with blessing. How is the uh, omnipresence of God, that is that God is everywhere at the same time. I'll give a more detailed definition of that in a moment. In a moment. Uh, how is it that uh, that is a blessing? What is a blessing about God being omnipresent? What's a blessing about that? Okay. Anyone uh, want to take a stab at that? You can either raise your hand and I'll... Uh, Okay, let's go with uh, Tim. I think I see you uh, with your hand, Tim. Yeah, yeah. Um, the blessing mm -hmm. about God's omnipresence mm -hmm. is that he's with you everywhere mm -hmm. and, and the most uncomfortable places to be at and also the most frightening places to be at. God's there. Mm -hmm. and is basking in his presence, you have confidence mm -hmm. and you're willing to go through whatever. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So the idea of uh, the fact that his presence is always there, that he's always there and that we cannot be out of his presence. Um, good. So he can help and guide us. That's good. Um, that God's uh, omnipresence communicates covering and protection. That's good. Covering and protection. That there are some things that don't impact us as greatly as maybe they could if it weren't for the covering of God and then also his protection. That uh, there's also comfort. Uh, that human relationships can fail us, but God never does. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. Uh, and so his personal presence is a blessing. By the way, I have some, I don't know if I have software issues, but uh, I understand that I froze. I was being very sensitive last time. I froze a few times. If I froze, fr freeze, I'm coming back. Just be patient with me. Uh, I haven't cracked the code of what that is in this new technology time. Uh, it's just one of them things I got to deal with. Uh, I've had route extenders and all kinds of things I've done. It hasn't resolved my problem, uh, but um, just be patient with me as you were last week, as I understand, I froze a few times, but came back and uh, picked up where I left off. So um, uh, uh, don't be alarmed if that happens. Uh, God is also in the presence of those who wish to do ill will to others. Yeah. So even those that are bad actors in the world, God is there watching them. Good. Anybody else? Anybody else? You can either raise your hand. I'm scanning to uh, see anybody that's raising your hand, or uh, you can answer in chat. Those are all good things. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I like the passage of Scripture that uh, he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, even until the end of the age, the end of the world, that God is with us. There's something very comforting about that, because people can't always be with you. And uh, yes, that's good, Patrice. It's comforting that the Lord's presence is also a promise. And uh, the Bible says that the promises of God are yes and amen. 
They're yes and amen. That is that we can take them to the bank when God promises us something about himself, particularly as it relates to his character, as God is unchanging and in him there is no shifting shadow. Anybody else? A good thing, a blessing about God being omnipresent. Okay. All right. What can be a challenge? What can be problematic about God being omnipresent? Can you think of anything that could be potentially problematic? Um, yeah, you can't hide your sins from God because he uh, is everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. You can't hide your sins. He's not only, I mean, it's very humbling to think that God not only knows everything about me, and sees everything about me, but that God um, um, uh, is there when I sin. Lord, have mercy. He's right in the midst. He's observing me sin. If I sin, if I deviate from his will. So yeah, I can't hide my sins. I can't fool him because he's right there. Any other problematic factor of his omnipresence. I think that uh, the reason why I frame that question that way is that uh, David is grappling with his omnipresence. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But David actually is struggling with the fact that God is omnipresent. Uh, anything else? Anything else? Okay. Uh, right. Uh, conformity versus pleasing God can be a problematic aspect of uh, his omnipresence. You're going to have to explain that for me, Cynthia. What do you mean by conformity versus pleasing God? What's that mean? Hey, Pastor Sexy Hans. Oh, yes. Hey, Hans. To explain that for me. Um, so I meant um, in the sense of it could bring a level of anxiety, uh, mm -hmm. wanting to conform to the ways of God as opposed to wanting to do his or fulfill his ways to please him okay why do you put them against each other conformity versus pleasing god what are you what are you thinking of um because sometimes you may be willing to conform but that doesn't mean that's something that you may want to do you may you may view it as a need as opposed to a want and i think okay. in, in certain instances it could be a little more genuine if it's a want okay okay interesting so it sounds almost like we can be under kind of a compulsion that God is watching us all the time, but, yeah. but that doesn't necessarily indicate quality of relationship. Good, good. Yep. Well, that's pretty nuanced. That's a nuanced insight. Okay, he knows everything I'm going to say and do before I do it. Yeah, yeah, that can be a little bit of a fatalistic aspect of the omnipresence of God that you, you kind of paired what you said with his omniscience as well. Um, because there have been those that have said, well, if he already knows everything, I'm going to do it before I do it. And he's already there before I arrive to do it, then, you know, finish the sentence. What is the purpose of me blank, whatever that is. So, yeah, I think sometimes people go fatalistic with that. And um, uh, feel a sense of futility. Uh, yes, you can't hide your faults and shortcomings because God sees it. Good. You cannot run away from God because he sees you wherever you are. And he's right there with you wherever you run to. He's waiting for you when you run. Yeah, those are problematic things. Uh, we saw that with, uh, I mentioned on Sunday about uh, Jonah, that Jonah ran only to run into God in a storm. Yeah, so that can be a problem, the idea of God's omnipresence. It is a blessing through and through, but it can also be problematic if we have other ideas about what we want our lives to be, how we want to behave, the choices we want to make that may be contrary to what God is saying. Okay, very good, good responses. Uh, I, we talked last week about a working definition of identity. And identity, we said, is the complex of personal traits, qualities, and characteristics of the human self that distinguish one individual from another. That is that we are all unique and we are all originals. It reflects the intelligent design of each individual's personality and purpose. 
which originates in God's mind and harmonizes with his plan for human history. I think it's important for us to realize that you were on the mind of God uh, throughout eternity. Before God said, let there be light, uh, you were on the mind of God. So you are a complex of personal traits uh, and qualities and characteristics. And um, uh, you are distinguished from everybody else. That's why it does not... Uh, serve your best purposes to compare yourself to somebody else, and you reflect the intelligent design of uh, God in your personality and purpose, and you as a person originated in the mind of God, and um, uh, who you are harmonizes with his plan for human history and how he wants to activate you in human history. I talked also about the idea of bypass, faith bypass. There's a problem of faith bypass. Many Christians fail to grow in their faith because they use the faith to bypass the hidden parts of themselves that stem maybe from personal traumas or difficulties that they've had. And um, God has called us to confront our pain, our wounds, our secret self that nobody else knows about, and uh, also to confront God with what we think about our hidden selves and uh, our inner life always shapes our outer world. So I, I'm concerned sometimes uh, in the context of church that sometimes people use faith as an escape, that they're not being real uh, with themselves uh, and with other people. Good. So I want to give uh, a second key, a second key. We uh, had a first key last week. Uh, to self-discovery. Uh, self-discovery key number one is embracing God's omniscience, the fact that he knows everything, allows me to discover my true self, that my ability to know myself is connected to God's perfect knowledge and total knowledge of who I am. And as I consult him in seeking to understand myself, uh, it allows me uh, to know myself better. But here's a second key, a second key. I'm giving four. Self-discovery is the courage to never hide from my true self. Boy, let me say that again. That uh, self-discovery is the courage to never hide from my true self. Um, seems so simple, that statement. The self-discovery is the courage to never hide from my true self but maybe we've all hidden from our true self because we didn't like what we saw or uh, what we, we discovered about ourselves did not harmonize uh, with what we wanted to believe about ourselves. Um, so spiritual maturity, I've said this over the years, that spiritual maturity is the capacity to handle the truth about yourself. That's really spiritual maturity. Uh, spiritual maturity is the capacity and the willingness for that matter to face the truth about yourself, your past, your present, and your future. Um, we will not grow spiritually, and we cannot say we're mature people if we can't handle the truth and face the truth about ourselves and the truth about our past. Sometimes we have some uh, things that have happened to us that were painful in our past or that shaped us negatively. And um, we can't hide from the things that impacted us negatively. And we can't hide from the things that are facing us in our present. And we can't hide from uh, the factors that are emergent in our lives concerning our future. And um, here's a kind of working definition of omnipresence. There's a working definition of omnipresence. Omnipresence is an attribute of God's infinite nature, whereby he transcends the limitations of time and space by being present in all places at all times simultaneously. Let me say that again. Omnipresence is an attribute of God's infinite nature. He's the only being, the only person that is omnipresent um, because that takes infinite nature to be omnipresent everywhere at the same time. It's an attribute of God's infinite nature whereby he transcends the limitations of time and space, which is the main obstacle to being omnipresent, by being present in all places at all times simultaneously. Um, the devil is ubiquitous. Satan is ubiquitous. He can be anywhere 
at any given time, at any given time. He is not everywhere at the same time. Talking about Satan, the enemy of our souls. He can only be ubiquitous. Uh, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere simultaneously. Uh, that is very difficult to imagine with our human minds, but God is everywhere at the same time, all right? There are two opposing theological truths about God. I thought it'd be interesting to tell you this. It's two opposing theological truths about God, and that is that God is a transcendent be being. He's transcendent. That means that God is far above and beyond the reality of his creation. Always remember that in your prayer life, that as you're praying, God is far above and beyond the reality that you are actively experiencing. He's above and beyond it. Uh, there are people very concerned about this election cycle and what's going to happen in November. Uh, last night, uh, former President Trump uh, won uh, predictably uh, over Nikki Haley and uh, won in Iowa last week. And he stands to win next week, I think, in South Carolina, uh, the former home and the place where Nikki Haley, his, his opponent, was governor. People are very concerned about what's going to happen. Ultimately, God is transcendent over who becomes president of the United States. Boy, do we need to hear that. The God is transcendent. He's not worried. God doesn't wring his hands cheering for one person over the other. God is far above and beyond the reality of his creation. God is far above and beyond what is un, uh, uh, unfolding in Gaza. He's far above and beyond it. But then this is another theological truth about God. He's imminent. Imminent is where we get the name Emmanuel, God with us. God is intimately involved with every dimension of his creation. Um, there are some faith systems that uh, say that God is transcendent, and they're very comfortable with a transcendent God that is far above and beyond the reality of his creation. But they're not so comfortable and don't make provision for an imminent God that he is intimately involved with every dimension of his creation. Uh, he is intimately acquainted with all of my ways and all of your ways. God um, is perfect in both aspects that seem opposite to one another, that he's above it and beyond what we see and what we experience, but he's intimately involved with every dimension of what we experience, whether we are fully aware of it or not. And so here's five proclamations to understand what we mean about omnipresence, okay? Uh, and we're going to be looking at um, uh, Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. The first thing I want you to know is that the omnipresent God is everywhere at the same time. I've said that it's very plain. The omnipresent God is everywhere at the same time. And David acknowledges this by saying, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I think that's fascinating that David in coming in contact and pondering God's omniscience and the fact that he knows everything and that there's nothing that he does not know uh, is so intimidating to him that his instinct was to run. His instinct was to run. I once knew a man who was a great visionary and uh, a former pastor. He was the president of uh, one of the leading seminaries in the nation in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, he was a founder of a prayer, international prayer movement by asking the question, what would it take uh, to see a sustained move of God in a given geographic location? And his answer to that question, good thinker, brilliant man, was pull pastors together in a region to pray for three days together with no plan, no script, but just put them in a room together to encounter God. And uh, he hired people like me uh, to facilitate pastors all over the nation. Toughest job I've ever done. The most difficult ministry assignment I've ever had by far was leading pastors into God's presence and having them put aside whatever it is. Sometimes there are differences. You know, I had to go places like Alabama and a polarized Birmingham, Alabama at that uh, and bring the pastors of Birmingham, Alabama together to pray, black and white, a few other expressions and uh, totally polarized uh, town, even into the late 90s, early 2000s. 
and bring them together for unity uh, and to pray together and discover the presence of God and a place like uh, Atlanta, Georgia, places like uh, St. Paul or Minneapolis, Minnesota, places like Joplin, Missouri. I've been, I've led, I, I largest summit I ever did was in the Bay Area and I have 300 pastors <laughs> and leading them, pastors and Christian leaders um, and facilitating them in the presence of God. It takes a kind of maturity and a patience and a humility, I think, uh, to observe and to facilitate a kind of midwife for what God might want to do. And then the spirit of any city always emerged uh, in whatever city I was in, whether it was in New England or whether it was in Colorado, wherever I was, traveled the whole nation, very challenging, particularly while pastoring, and um, and um, uh, and so um, this man who founded this movement, brilliant man, I noticed that when we would come to the, this brilliant man suffered with Parkinson's and really grappled with the irony of being this leader of the prayer movement in the world and, uh, and, and suffering with Parkinson's. And he submitted, but it was difficult for him. And I noticed at some point in his faith that whenever something deep was about to happen and God's move was happening in a room, he would start singing camp songs. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. I mean, and so are you, you know. And uh, I was so puzzled by that. Why would he, at on the brink of very serious breakthrough and things that God was doing in a room with God? God's men, and sometimes God's women in the room, he would break out into a silly song. And it's because he was running from God. He, he was afraid of God's presence. This spiritual giant, he's published. And uh, I even taught his book for Bible class one several years ago. Brilliant man. He was afraid of God's presence because God's presence brought him Parkinson's. God's presence bought him other things that he didn't bargain for. And so it makes sense sometimes as humans uh, that sometimes we don't want to be in God's presence. We try to flee from God's presence. I think the more sensitive that we are to God's presence, the more sensitive we are to the power of God and his presence, the more fearful we can become. Of it. But I, I, I discover this is the lesson. I discover my true self when I'm willing to encounter God on his terms. I've got to be able to be willing to encounter God on his terms. The omnipresent God is everywhere at the same time. And I might ask that question like David did, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Because your presence is intimidating sometimes. Your presence shakes me to my foundation. And I'm afraid sometimes of what you're going to say to me. I've shepherded a lot of people, thousands of people, I'm sure, over the years. And I've run into some people that were very afraid of the presence of God because they did not want to hear what God had to say. Sometimes they were keenly aware of a calling on their lives or something God wanted to do with them and through them. And um, and uh, they they were afraid of what God was going to say. But I I, I cannot discover who I am unless I'm willing to encounter God on his terms. And God says marvelous and comforting and revelatory things to us that gives great comfort to our soul. And sometimes God reveals troubling things to us, difficult things to us. That's mature. Uh, that's a Bible class insight that sometimes God does speak some things to us that we may not want to hear. But if we're going to know ourselves and our plan, uh, God's plan for our lives and who we are, We've got to encounter him on his terms. Here's a second thing. Here's a second thing. The omnipresent God is both celestial and terrestrial. There are some people that are very comfortable with a God in heaven while we down here on earth. But God, the omnipresent God, is both celestial in the uh, in the heavens and he's also terrestrial. He's uh, uh, involved in the earth. David says, if I go up to the heavens in outer space, you are there. And then he gives an opposite statement. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, 
What do you think he's saying? What does David mean by if I make my bed in the depths? What do you think he's talking about there? Anybody want to want to answer that? What 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 is God? What is uh, David talking about? If I make my bed in the depths, a hint is that he's saying something opposite to the heavens. What do you think he's talking about? Making bed in the depths. Very good. The Hebrew word sheol. Very good. And what does that mean? Sheol. What's that mean? The word sheol is a Hebrew word throughout the Old Testament, whenever it is talking about uh, the destiny of people that uh, experience something. Anybody know what that is, Sheol? Uh, could be hell, could be hell, could be. It's really the place of the dead. Yeah, the place of the dead. Not specifically hell or, or a place of torment necessarily, but, uh, and yeah, one of the old expressions of that uh, old school was the bosom of Abraham uh, before Christ came and died on the cross. And there's a whole two compartment theory that there was, you know, place for people in hell and then a place people waiting for Jesus, uh, which is a difficult the theological position I won't talk about right now. Uh, we'll deal with that another time. But yeah, Sheol is uh, very basically the place of the grave, the grave, the place where we bury people, the ground. Uh, sometimes beyond the ground, sometimes uh, uh, the destiny of people beyond their physical body being in the ground. And so he's making a reference to being buried, being in the depths of the earth that you dig a hole for me and put me in the earth. So God is not only the God of the celestial, he's the God of the terrestrial. If I'm going to discover my true self, I've got to reconcile heaven with earth. I can't just have a dichotomy of the God of heaven versus my life on earth, or I will never really grow or understand who God is. The person of Jesus is all about bringing heaven and earth together, reconciling those realities that uh, Jesus, who is from heaven, comes to earth and wraps himself in flesh uh, to redeem the world. So the omnipresent God is both celestial as it relates to the heavens and also terrestrial. Here's a third idea. The omnipresent God is God over life and death. He is the God over life and death. If I'm, I'm saying that second part of that last statement, if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. That God is not only the God of uh, life, he's the God of death. Um, uh, Luke 20, 38 says this. Luke 20, verse 38 says, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Uh, Jesus is stating a fact that ultimately God is not the God of the dead because he sees even those that have died who cease to exist in this dimension as still alive. And he doesn't make the same distinction that we do between the dead and the living because he has perfect knowledge of both and perfect interaction with both. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And uh, for to him, all, even those who died, are alive. Um, here, here's a quote I want you to consider. I want you to consider this quote. It's kind of grim. It's from Orson Welles of, of uh, Citizen Kane fame, among other things. We're born alone, we live alone, we die alone. Only through our love and friendship can we create the illusion for the moment that we're not alone. Let me say that again. We're born alone, we live alone, we die alone. Only through our love and friendship can we create the illusion for the moment that we're not alone. This is what Orson Welles, Shakespearean actor and brilliant director. I think he was like 25 years old when he directed Citizen Kane. Some people believe Citizen Kane is the greatest movie of all time. It's been studied in cinematic um, classes um, for a long, long time, for maybe 70 years. Uh, I want to hear from you. I don't want to just put it. You can put it in chat if you want. What do you think of that? What's your reaction to that quote? What's your reaction, and do you think it's true or it's false? We're born alone, we live alone, we die alone. Only through our love and friendship can we create the illusion for the moment that we're not alone. I want somebody to speak to that for me. 
What are your thoughts, your thoughts about that? Raise your hand, uh, either with the mechanism of the hand raising, uh, or you can, uh, in reactions, if you're looking at a screen, you can raise your hand, or you can raise it on the screen. If I can see you, I'll call on you. I want somebody to speak. Yeah, yeah. Tim never lets me down. Tim always responds. So, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Well, thank you, Pastor, for that. Um, mm -hmm. I disagree. You and disagree I, with his? You disagree with the quote? I I disagree. Why? Why do you disagree? Because nobody is born alone. Even okay. if you have someone there with you when you are born. Okay. That's, so the inference he might be saying is that you stay to yourself. I mean, but. Mm -hmm. Nobody's born alone. That's idiotic. Well, let, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. Even if you're a twin or a multiple, you experience birth alone. You, you, Nobody's born with you. You experience birth and come into the light and the shock and the scariness of sounds. Everything's been muffled and comforting and warm and the heartbeat of your mother. And then all of a sudden, everything's so loud and bright. We're born alone. Then he says, you know, we live alone. Nobody lives the Tim Diggity life but you. You're the only person that lives the Tim Diggity life uh, on your own. Even though you live with people alongside of you, you can only be Tim by yourself. And when you die, you will die alone. No one will experience death for you or in your stead or along with you in a shared experience that we're dying and feeling death and experiencing death together, you, you, his point is that we, 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 we experience birth, death, alone, and he goes a little further with it by saying that love and friendship creates the illusion for the moment. It's pretty grim, but. Is there so? What do you think about that? Uh, do you agree that you are born alone? Nobody, you didn't experience birth with someone else. You experienced birth for yourself. You experience life as an individual, and you die as an individual. Even if there are people with you when you die, or it's an event that other people die, you experience those things: birth, life, death, individually. That's his point. Not that there's nobody in the room, but individually. What do you think about that, Tim? I don't, I, I have a hard time grappling with that. I'm, good, good. I like how you put it, that you grapple. Good. Keep yeah. grappling. Keep grappling. I'm, I'm going to move on to somebody else. Keep grappling. Uh, yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else want to speak to that? That's a heavy thing. You know, part of Bible class is not just studying the Bible. But other ideas that challenge what the Bible says, maybe. That's a little different narrative than what we see in the Bible, isn't it? It's a different narrative. I mean, unless you go into deep the, the deep bowels of Job. Uh, Job uh, has some dark ideas like that. You know, he talks at one point about the day of his birth being completely removed from God's memory. You know, yes, uh, Ethel Nichols, one of my favorite people. Ethel Nichols, we want you, want to hear from you on this. You, uh, we might just do what you say, uh, uh, Ethel, because you are known a genarian. So, uh, we 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 want to hear your wisdom. Well, I I, I really do agree with Arson Wells because um, mm -hmm. I think after, uh, you know, there are times in life when we become very aware uh -huh. uh, that we're alone when we are in a room full of people and, you know, at a party or even with family sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then we sense that we really are alone uh, because our thoughts or our feelings, um, even with the love and friendship that we're experiencing, mm -hmm. uh, we begin to see that in a sense, it, it is illusional. Um, wow. I know uh, for myself, uh, it, it 
when I received Christ mm. and um, they said, um, you have to receive Christ for yourself. Well, I was raised in a Christian family and my grandmother, my mother, and, and I went to church and I, you know, had a lot of friends and they all at church, but I had to make the decision myself. I alone could make that decision that I would receive Christ into my life. Mm -hmm. And then once I made that decision, then I realized that the decisions that I made, I had, you know, if I did them, I wanted to please God and mm -hmm. I could not always please others. You know, mm -hmm. others would not see what I saw or feel what I felt. Yes. And so in that sense, I began to really see the aloneness, but it's, wow. it's not a loneliness. It huh. is aloneness. That, 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 yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute, yeah. Ethel. You, 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 uh, you are so wise. Uh, you said so many things that are profound. And I want to particularly underline the last thing you said that you have come to the place of acceptance of aloneness, even though it's not loneliness. Could you speak to that a little more? Okay, let me uh, let me unmute you. Yeah, oh, there you okay. go. Uh -huh. Could you speak to that a little bit more? Well, I, I, I think uh, now, uh, particularly, I guess, because of the age that I am, Yes. And so many of my friends have passed on. So many wow. family members are gone. You know, as they, uh, what does the scripture say? When my mother and my father, you know. Forsake me. me. Yes. Yeah, forsake. But uh -huh. then, and then you realize it's, it's you and Christ. It's you and God. Wow. And uh, that is a wonderful thing. But wow. then it is, it is on me to please God. It, it is not on him to please me. <laughs> and, wow. and I can't, I, even though I pray for my friends, I pray for my family, I, mm. but I can't order God around. I can't mm -hmm. say, you know, I, I may try, <laughs> but <laughs> he, he, won't, right. he won't stand for that. <laughs> oh my goodness. So you almost, why do I sense almost, you, you, you have something north of acceptance. You, you almost sound... Uh, either I, I could say joyous or if not joyous, you seem serene. You seem serene and at peace with your aloneness, uh, even in the stark uh, reality of living long enough that most of your contemporaries disappear. You seem at peace with that. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yes, that's correct. That's what? Correct. Why? Why is it that you don't you don't seem to show fear or dread? You seem to have a very cheerful or uh, positive viewpoint of aloneness. I mean, this is not everyday conversation where we talk about the distinction between aloneness and loneliness. What do you think it is that informs your sense of peace and serenity in what you describe? Well. That I attribute to God, you know, the mm, serenity yes. prayer, as we call it. Yes. God grant me the serenity wow. to accept the things I cannot yes. change. Courage yes. to change the things I can and yes. the wisdom to know the difference. And wow. I think God grants us the serenity that we ask for. You know, he said... If if you ask for the Holy Spirit, would I not give it to you? You know, if mm. the unjust judge will, will give it to the woman that kept bothering him, wouldn't yes. I give to my children who entreat right. me night and day? So he gives you what you ask for. Mm -hmm. And he has given me that serenity. I it's not in and of myself. Mm -hmm. It's it's what he has given to me. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, you know, I'm going. You, you, you taking my Bible class. You done took over as the teacher of my Bible <laughs> well, class. I have. Yeah, that's true. You have, <laughs> you have taken over. Brilliant, beautiful things. Thank you so much for sharing. Let me move to Nicole, or not Nicole, Monique. Uh, Monique, you said you wanted to respond to that.
I think I've unmuted you. Okay. Can you unmute yourself? You look yes. like you're driving though. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, and I agree with um, the person who talked before because I look at it as that we are we are singularity, real. We are single mm -hmm. yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. Um, even though we are a single large organism with multi things, multi organisms are multi things in us. We're still single. When you go mm -hmm. to the doctors, the doctor's not going to example. The doctor's not going to examine your wife and give you a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Going to examine you. So. Yeah. So we are single in that. The other thing is in that the illusion of being alone of, with people, treating people as an illusion. That's because people come and go. But God right. is the reality and the anchor. So are so, you saying God you agree? Is not a person. Are you I saying agree you with, agree with Orson Welles? Yes, I do. Wow. Wow. Isn't that interesting? I love it when we can kind of tap in and put aside our, you know, because sometimes faith can be, I, this is what I'm talking about, bypass. There's some people to bypass aloneness, as Ethel Nichols said. To bypass it, they subscribe to faith that makes them not feel so alone. And it's not so much the loneliness that they suffer from, it's the aloneness that they, some people can't handle being alone. And Orson Welles is kind of brave in acknowledging that he's alone. I, he was very depressive. Um, uh, I think he had a drinking problem. Uh, so he had despair involved in where I'll, I'll speak to that in a moment. But I want to deal with some of your responses. Uh, you all have said quite a bit. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying about, you know, we're never alone in the ultimate sense because God is omnipresent with us. That's true. Um, some cultures might argue ancestors and forebears experience life with us. Or, or God and angels uh, involved. He gives his angels charge concerning us. That's an interesting idea. I agree. Uh, uh, if there were not a measure of truth to the statement, we would not have so many people struggling with anxiety and depression. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty profound in these. Yes, that people struggle with aloneness. That's the essence of uh of that. You know, I could ask it in the form of a question. It'd be so interesting to ask questions, but I can't do it in this format. Uh, but well, maybe I will. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. What is the what is the what is the saddest place on earth? Anybody know? What's the what's the place where there are more depressed people than anywhere else on earth? What nation? Anybody know? Give me a guess. Put it in chat. Put it in chat. What's the where where are there more depressed people per capita? Yes, boy, first person, United States. Yes, United States, United States is pretty much where people are depressed the most. That's where you have more people per capita that experience depression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. Um, what is the uh, happiest place on earth? Anybody know? What nation is the happiest place? Anybody have a guess? Sweden or Norway? Yes, very true. Yes, yes, yes. Sweden, yeah. So what is the, you know, uh, what is the, uh, that's true. What What is the highest uh, suicide rate per capita? Anybody? What nation has the highest suicide rate per capita? Yes, Sweden. Yes. And so why is that? Why is that? Why does Sweden have, if they're the happiest place, why do they have the highest suicide rate? Uh, why is that? Well, I think I'll answer it. I'll answer it for you. Because in Sweden you're more isolated and alone in your depression because everybody else is so happy. <laughs> and so people in Sweden commit suicide at a higher rate per capita than in the USA because all of us feel sad here in the USA by something or another, right? So there's a kind of normalcy to being sad. There's a normalcy to being depression. 
de de being depressed. So they don't know how to deal, yes, TR, with, with depression. Yeah, they don't know how to deal with it. And they're so isolated in their experience. They're so alone in their sadness that they feel strange. And um, this is a thing that um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell covers uh, in one of his books. I'm, I'm ru running a blank. If you, anybody remember that book that he develops that I think quite brilliantly um, is a tipping point, might be tipping point. Uh, so very, very interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. And I agree. Uh, I, I, it's interesting. One of you, um, Lynn said, I'm a twin. And I agree with Mr. Orson Welles <laughs> that as a twin, and she's very close to her twin. And her her twin is an adjunct member of Careview, and yet she understands being alone. Um, and they're very distinct personalities. And so, yeah, you said context is crucial: alone versus loneliness, Doctor D. But even in the lo aloneness, uh, God is connected to our reality. Good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah. Inside out kind of deals with some of that. Uh, Inside Out's coming out with a second one. Life confronts us individually, so therefore, although support comes from people in theory, um, uh, uh, it can represent a sense of togetherness that could be illusory. Good. You all really thought deeply about this. So yeah, I think I think most of us agree, at least to some point, with Mr. Wells, uh, that we agree with him. The problem is, is his bias and perspective. He, oh boy, I, I almost feel like praising the Lord. His sense of aloneness is in a closed system that excludes God. Hallelujah. But our sense of aloneness, as Ethel put forth, is an open system that includes God, and we are under God's care. And you could even say that faith in Christ is the means by which we find the courage to live alone and to experience life alone, to be born alone, where we're not as conscious of ourselves, we don't have self-awareness, to live alone, to die alone, to deal with our mortality, uh, that our faith in Christ makes that possible. Jesus went up the Via Dolorosa, the way of pain, that, 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 that uh, uh, highway that we described was the path to Golgotha. He traveled it alone. And he, he took the sting out of death, and he took victory away from the grave. And aloneness is not the same as if there was not a true and living God in the midst of our aloneness. And the fact even that God is within us, that we accept him to take residence inside of us in our consciousness, in our bodies, in our emotions, the salvation is... Um, uh, it is a submersive reality of faith that God is with me. So when he says, I'll be with you and even until the end of the age, uh, he is not just saying geographically, he's saying experientially and on the inside that God is with us. I just think that's a fascinating quote, but Mr. Wells probably never acknowledged God and so I don't know that people are an illusion. Love and friendship is an illusion. I think it just accentuates uh, and adds quality to life. And um, uh, even if people can't experience exactly what I experience. And so there's a lesson in that. The lesson is I discover my true self when I'm willing to face my own mortality. Um, uh, I discover my true self. Go back to that other panel before this. Uh, I, I, I discover my true self when I'm willing to face my own mortality, when I'm willing to face the idea that I'm going to die. Amen, amen, amen. That don't sound encouraging, but it should be that I'm going to die. I'm going to leave this life. That is not a scary thing, um, that uh, God has taken all of the fear out of death. We have no reason to fear death. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and that God is with us at all time, even as we live through this life, experiencing it individually. Uh, maybe that's a better word, that we live individually. Maybe that's what he should have said, that we are born individually, we live individually, we die individually, 
Um, and that is the essence of what aloneness is. Let me move to the next idea here. And that is that the omnipresent God is, is guide and comfort in remote spaces. When I'm in unfamiliar spaces, when I'm in faraway spaces, the Bible says, if I uh, rise on the wings of the dawn, that's east, where dawn happens, where the sun rises. If I settle on the far side of the sea, he's probably talking about the Mediterranean Sea, that's west. Even there, your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. It's a fact uh, that in longitude and latitude, north and south meet. North and south actually meet. That if I go to the North Pole, and I actually go, uh, you know, I, I can go north until I'm going south. North and south actually meet. That is not true of east and west. That is not true of east and west. East and west never meet uh, in terms of uh, the earth. Um, it's one of the reasons why Psalm 103 says, uh, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Because uh, east and west never meet, which is a, a a marvelous way of describing the fact that God separates our sins away from us, that we don't uh, have to deal with the, all of the implications of our sin um, because of the goodness of God in loving us in Psalm 103. And so um, even in the most remotest of places, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, if I can move at the speed of light, at the point of dawn, or even on the far side of the sea, even there you will guide me. He's come to grips with God's presence and says, I, maybe I shouldn't be running away from you, but maybe in remote spaces, I need you to guide me and then I need your right hand to hold me fast. That's another response to Orson Welles, that it's God's hand that holds me fast, that steadies me and comforts me, even when I am in remote and unfamiliar spaces. There are circumstances in life that are unfamiliar. There are diagnoses that we can get from doctors that are unfamiliar. There are experiences that we can have that are unfamiliar. And I discover my true self when I'm willing to encounter God, not only on his own terms, uh, but um, um, but when I can uh, realize uh, that God is my comfort and my guide uh, in remote places. Here's a last idea. The, uh, the omnipresent God is in the darkness as well as the light. Uh, God is in the darkness as well as the light. We like to describe God in terms of light, illumination, um, uh, clarification. The God is clear. Um, uh, God represents brightness and glory. The idea of glory is a very bright idea. Uh, the word glory in the New Testament, doxa, means the proper estimation of something or the proper value of something. The Shekinah of God in the Old Testament. It's kind of bright idea. The omnipresent God is not only in the light, he's in the darkness. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, David says, and the light be uh, become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. David says that darkness is like light to God, to an all-knowing omnipresent God. That no matter how dark you feel, no matter how dark your life gets, no matter how depressed you get, some of us have dark moods, really dark moods. You got some low lows. And uh, in your low lows, David says that uh, you can't hide in your deepest depression because in your deepest depression, uh, the darkness of your depression becomes as light and shines as the day. Yes, his word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And God brings light even in the midst of darkness. Darkness is as light to you. For us, we need to turn on a light or light a candle or we have to um, develop means by which we can see clearly when things are dark. Uh, but to God... Uh, he sees everything as bright and 
compelling. Uh, it reminds me of Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the second sentence in all of the Bible, now the earth was formless and empty. Read that as dark, formless and empty. In Hebrew, tohu and bohu. It was formless and chaotic. It was chaotic, it had no order. Uh, whatever existed in the nothingness, the nothingness was chaotic and formless. And then it says darkness was over the surface of the deep. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the deep. Sometimes it's translated waters, but more literally, it's, it's deep. God hovers over deep darkness. Boy, there's a lot of application to that. That in dark spaces, in dark times in history, there was a dark ages. And out of the dark ages comes the Renaissance and this burst of art and burst of creativity. Uh, not long, we'd have people like uh, Michelangelo, and we'd have people like, um, um, uh, you know, some of the most creative people uh, that have, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, you cannot uh, hide the light of God and the glory of God in darkness, even in dark times. Some of us have lived through some dark times. The Spirit of God hovers over dark and hovers over the, the deep. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. I'm always gripped by uh, when the Ten Commandments come from Mount Sinai. It says, when the people saw the thunder and the lightning, and they heard the trumpet, and saw the mountain, uh, Mount Sinai, saw smoke, they trembled with fear, and they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, they said to Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. God is going to kill us based on the cataclysm uh, that God showed up with thunder and lightning and trumpets and a, a, a mountain that seemed to be on fire because there's smoke. You talk to us, be our middleman, but we don't want to deal with God. It's kind of uh, what I was talking about, about this great leader that sung camp songs and silly songs when he was in the presence of God because he had grown fearful of God. Um, and, uh, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning in Exodus 20, 18 through 21. And this is very interesting. Notice what the scriptures say. It says the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Uh, Moses dared to go into the uncertainty and the thick darkness where God dwells. Sometimes God is in the midst of thick darkness, things that we don't understand, things that are mysterious. I think sometimes we don't make enough provision. Maybe preachers like myself don't preach enough about the mystery of God, uh, sometimes the unknowability of God. Uh, Moses has become accustomed with the ways of God. Uh, indeed, in Psalm 103, it talks about that uh, uh, the, you know, that the people of God saw the deeds of God, but Moses saw the ways of God. And one of the ways of God is that an omnipresent God is not just the God of light. He's the God in darkness. As Moses approached the thick darkness where God was, the lesson for us, I discover my true self when I'm willing to face inner and outer darkness, the darkness of my circumstance and the darkness of myself. We all have some inner darkness. Amen, amen. That's why we need a gospel. That's why we need a savior, that we got some dark parts of who we are. We have unresolved parts of who we are. Um, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not bothered when uh, I talk to people as a shepherd who are angry with God. I almost get a little hopeful. I get, I get a little excited when people tell me they're angry with God about something or or they're in a dark place, because uh, sometimes in our dark place, we're closer to God than we were in a bright place, because maybe part of our relationship with God was predicated on how good things were, and uh, maybe, maybe some of our faith was predicated on the light, and light not only as it relates to brightness and luminescence of our lives that we're enjoying, but the lightness of life, that life doesn't feel heavy that life is not difficult or challenging for us. Uh, God is in the thick darkness sometimes. And uh, 
God can handle your darkness. Um, sometimes you've maybe encountered people that couldn't handle your darkness <laughs> and they were intimidated by it or they felt uh, put off by your darkness. Uh, I discover my true self when I'm willing to face my inner darkness as well as the state of the world. I, I want to show you, speaking of, of uh, inner darkness, the self-appraisal of the greatest man of the New Testament. We we could always say that Jesus is the greatest man of both Testaments, but the greatest man of the New Testament uh, said this about himself. He said, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good as it is. It is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Boy, does that sound familiar? That sound familiar? Uh, we all have parts of, yeah, did you see where the Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament? And he actually says, I don't understand what I do. I don't understand why I can't get myself together. Man, you know, I've often read this and said, man, if Paul can't get it together, what is going to happen to me? That like, Paul doesn't understand why I keep stumbling. Why do I keep failing? Why do I keep failing that test? Why do I keep circling back? Why is am I on repeat that I keep doing the sin that I don't want to do and the good that I want to do, I, 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 I can't manage to do. That's a self-appraisal. You know what this man did? He confronted his inner darkness. He, he made peace. <laughs> Lord have mercy. And, and did you hear how he ended? He said, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. He wasn't depressed. He wasn't funereal. He just said that I've been delivered by Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's what he's saying, that I've been delivered by Jesus Christ. Uh, but then he says, in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law. That's my will. That's what I want to do. I want to be a slave to the goodness of God and what he tells me to do. But in my sinful nature, I'm a slave to the law of sin. You know what he's saying? He's saying that my old man never changes. Did you know that? Did you know your old nature that you were born with never changes? You may change. You may grow. But your old nature, your sin nature don't get saved. <laughs> Okay, your mind, your soul, your your will get saved, uh, but your old nature don't get saved. It's not it's not redeemable. You still have an old nature, and God did not obliterate your old nature when you got saved. That old uh, nature rears its ugly head every now and then. You can hear it come out of your mouth sometimes. You ever hear your old nature in your thoughts? Yeah. You ever think something foul? You ever be in church? Maybe this has never happened to y'all. You've been in church and a terrible thought comes to mind. <laughs> Might even be why Pastor James is preaching. Where did that come from? Well, check in with Romans 7, chapter 7. And uh, we don't have a closed system of going through life alone like Mr. Orson Welles. We have an open system that God is completely involved in, that he is not only a transcendent God, that is above and beyond everything that we experience, everything we feel, everything we lament about ourselves. He's transcendent, but he's also Im imminent. He's 
intimately acquainted with all of your ways and all of my ways, and his hand is on me, hallelujah, to comfort me in the unfamiliar spaces, in the remote places of life where sin maybe took me further than I wanted to go, that he's my guide back home, just like the prodigal son found his way back home after he had rejected his father. Um, and so uh, that's where I'm going to land tonight, uh, that uh, the omnipresent God is in the darkness as well as the light. He can handle your darkness tonight. Yes, he can. He can handle the uncertainty of your life. Um, you know, one of the things that I think excites the Holy Spirit is when you don't have a clue. When you don't have a clue, God does his best work and moves through your cluelessness and makes you malleable and he shapes you and he uh, makes your path straight. And um, he is the omnipresent God um, over not only life, but also death. He is not only celestial and he's not apple pie in the sky by and by, but he's in the midst of your daily grind, your daily life the things that trouble your soul. There are things that trouble my soul about the world. I actually think about global warming. I'm a little bit, maybe I'm a little morose, but I think about global warming. I think about, I think about the divisiveness of our nature, uh, of our nation, I should say, and our discourse. Uh, God is involved in the earth and he's everywhere at the same time. So therefore we have nothing to worry about that he is sovereign, even in the midst of a broken world with broken people in it. Uh, I want to give you a homework assignment. This is going to be a good homework assignment for you. Very good homework assignment. And that's this. Uh, I want you to meditate upon Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. Two verses. Psalm 139, 13 and 14. Fearfully, what, what it's meant, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It, what it says, I'm giving you a brief teaching on it. Um, fearfully means that you and I reflect God's character, that God was fearful or reverent in designing you. You represent the character of God and how you are designed, how God created you. And you are wonderfully made. Wonderfully means that you reflect uh, God's imagination. You're a reflection of God's character, his goodness, his reverence for what he made. God reverences what he made in you, whether you reverence it or not. And you're wonderfully made. You represent God's imagination and how he made you. So your homework is I want you to list three traits about yourself that are fearful, that reflect God's character, and three traits about yourself that are wonderful. I can't wait to hear you tell me why you're wonderful. I want to hear it. I want you to tell me why you're wonderful. No, and I want you to get, get creative. Uh, I'm wonderful because I'm a child of God. Don't do that. Don't bring that to my Bible class. Don't tell me you're wonderful because you're a child of God. And don't bring that you fearfully made, you know, because you care about your fellow man. I, tell me something deep. I want you to go deep. What is fearful? What do you see about yourself that God reverences that reflect his character? There are some things in you that God put there. Your parents didn't put it there. God put it there. What are those things? Can you go to the depth of it? Can you go to the depth of it? Can you tell me why you're wonderful? Yeah, I want us to brag on God a little bit and how he made us. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, it's something that we don't often do in, in faith. We don't talk about how we're fearfully and wonderfully made. I want us to do that next week. At the top of our Bible class, you're going to tell me why you are fearful, fearfully, and why you are wonderfully made, okay? Any questions? Are there any questions before we end tonight's Bible class? Any questions whatsoever? Any questions? Really good feedback you all gave. Thank you so much for contributing and uh, sharing your ideas and chat. And uh, my co-teacher in Ethel Nichols, uh, thank you for our guest Bible teacher. Uh, <laughs> she shared her, her experience, which was wonderful. Uh, I'm sure you were blessed by that um, uh, because God has blessed her with a maturity of perspective that can help all of us uh, to embrace how we live this life. No questions? No questions? Anybody have any questions? 
Okay, okay, right. Uh-huh. All right, okay. All right, then we can fold our presentation. And uh, several people have uh, said thank you to you, uh, Sister Ethel, and uh, appreciated your contribution. That's wonderful. And um, we have a new perspective about what it means to be alone. That just because you're alone, don't mean you by yourself. Amen. <laughs> Uh, we can deal with being alone, but you are not by yourself because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you even to the end of the age. God is in your thoughts, in your inner person. I find uh, as I mature, as I grow older, I do a lot of praying in my sleep. I do a lot of praying through the night and when I'm waking up, I'm praying, sometimes half formed thoughts. And I, I'm praying, sometimes out loud slightly, sometimes quietly. And uh, God is in the midst of my thoughts, in the midst of my prayers and requests. He's intimately acquainted with all of my ways, just as he is yours. And so, uh, amen. May you uh, uh, take comfort in his goodness. Let's look to the Lord together. Father, we thank you for all that you have said to us tonight. And we thank you for your omnipresence. We are comforted tonight that the, the fact that you are everywhere at the same time means that you are our guide everywhere we go, no matter where we are, no matter what the vicissitudes of life, whatever changes come, circumstances come, you are in the midst with us as our guide. You also are our comfort as your hand steadies us and holds us fast that you uh, always are holding on to us and always comforting us. And so, Lord, tonight we give you praise and we give you glory and honor for your providential care over us and that you're always watching over us and are there, that even when we leave to go places, you're already there before we arrive. And you're the place still where we left, that we, uh, no matter where we go, we are in your presence. Now, Lord, I pray that this week, that which remains of it, that we would interact with your presence qualitatively, not just qualit quantitatively, that we would realize that you are there. You are an imminent God. You are Emmanuel, God, with us in the midst of whatever we're going through, experiencing it with us, guiding us by your spirit. And so, Lord, may we take courage for all that is coming uh, whether it is pleasant or unpleasant, challenging or delightful, um, walk with us every step of the way. And as you said, Lord Jesus, um, thank you for the comfort that you've given us, who leads us and guides us into all truth. We give you our very selves. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say, amen. Amen. Thank you.